Thank, thank you all for coming and showing up. And Colleen's sort of been herding the cats to come in and, and get the morning's uh, event going. Um, I'm Oswald Schmitz. I'm uh, the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And I'm here on behalf of our Dean, Indy Burke, and the faculty and students in the school to welcome you uh, to this wonderful conference. And it's an important conference um, that's being convened by the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies uh, Hickson Urban Center for Urban Ecology. Um, uh, that, that aims to explore ways to meet the challenges of sustainability um, and equitab equitab equitability, equitability <laughs> pardon the, um, in cities in the 21st century. Um, this conference is an extension of uh, our university president, Peter Salovey's efforts um, to present forums on Yale Explorers throughout the U.S. where he's actually featuring faculty research in different forums in, uh, across the country. And today's conference is a gathering of Yale faculty that are addressing uh, commonalities in, in urban uh, analysis uh, here on, on campus. And so that we're showcasing uh, some of the great faculty research that's being done here. Um, in our school, we see the word cities, environment, and nature being used together a lot uh, these days. It represents, I think, a rapid transformation in how um, we've come about to reimagine the world and humans' place within it. And it is a rapid transformation because just 25 years ago, you could argue that the school, the, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, was really organized around addressing problems of management and conservation of ecosystems that formed wild nature and management of pollution uh, within human-dominated urban environment. And so it tended to per perpetuate this late 19th century early uh, and um, 20th century worldview that humans and nature existed apart. Um, and where, where, where nature was this idyllic place, a verdant landscape with clean air and fresh water and wildlife were roaming freely across the landscape. And the human built environment actually was places where people crowded in and suffered uh, from environmental degradation. Um, the, the research at that time didn't really focus on humans specifically very much. Um, so part of the transformation in thinking that emerged, it actually emerged in the school, uh, began with research by a venerable professor in the school, William Birch. Um, he was a social scientist. Um, uh, he, he was a social scientist who, who was really interested in thinking about the urban realm. And he made the perhaps jarring claim at the time that cities could actually be a different form of nature. Okay. And what he did was he developed a world view where urban areas, especially cities, could be a different form of nature by integrating um, ideas from anthropology, ecology, and social sciences, where he really actually conceptualized ecosystems as, or cities as functioning ecosystems. Um, so the human ecosystems model that he put forward puts humans squarely at the center of a nature. Um, a, a nature emerging from human social, economic, and cultural values and actions. And that transformation in thinking is actually what led to this, the start of the Hickson Center for Urban Ecology in the school. Um, it also changed the core world, core world view we now hold in the school, in which we imagine all places around the world as different sort of realizations of nature. Um, they're complementary, albeit different forms. Um, and humans are inter integral parts of it everywhere. And it's especially true, of course, for the urban areas that are becoming even more central to both understanding environmental challenges and their solutions, um, especially to create built urban environments based on sustainability principles learned from e the ecological sciences and understanding ecosystem processes to create verdant landscapes for humans and biodiversity, to provide clean air and water and access to healthy food so that all members of the human community can seek out their lives and livelihoods in just and equitable ways. See, I got it right this time. Um, realizing this new urban realm and call, and, and call to action to develop a more equitable and sustainable urban future is an important part of the school's strategic vision and action going forward. In fact, we're in the process of developing a new um, master's specialization in urban studies. 
Um, we also recognize the importance of partnering with like-minded uh, people around campus, uh, like the ones you'll hear from today, um, to help foster a Yale-wide urban initiative on thinking about you know, integrating the humanities and the sciences. Um, I think this new view opens the door to bring together the science and humanities in a way that help us to understand environmental issues from the lens of justice, social equity, and human health that are inextricably linked to all environmental problems and solutions, including urbanization and climate change, toxic chemicals and pollution prevention, energy production and use, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services that do, in fact, produce the clean air and water and access to open spaces that, that, that we rely on today and, and can help to build a more sustainable future. So the conference today draws from many uh, different parts of Yale, some parts such as the Department of Anthropology and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies have been always, ha always had a direct focus on the environment. Others, such as the School of Management, the Law School, and the School of Architecture, perhaps historically were less engaged, but are nonetheless now bringing fresh voices to new and new ideas to advance um, sort of the idea of sustainable um, cities and the conversation around that. So I find this very exciting. It represents an instrumental step in catalyzing the kind of bold new thinking we need to achieve um, to get a sustainable and just urban world. So with that, I hope you enjoy the day and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Oz, um, and welcome, everyone. I am Colleen Murphy Dunning. I'm the director of the Hickson Center for Urban Ecology, and glad to welcome you all to today's conference. I have the um, primary function of housekeeping, which is to keep us on schedule today. So I will be asking for your help um, so that when we have our breaks that we come in um, at our scheduled time, in part because we want to hear from all of our speakers and make sure we have, give them their time, but also because we have an external audience via webcast today. So they will be um, on the internet waiting for you all to finish coffee and come back or lunch and come back. So um, please help me um, to stay on schedule. And also, when you have questions for the speakers, please use the microphone. If you just raise your hand and start speaking, the external audience via webcast will not hear your question. So that will be important. I also have the pleasure to introduce some of our external speakers today, um, starting with our morning keynote speaker, Timothy Papandreou. Timothy is the founder of Emerging Transport Advisors, providing strategic guidance to clients to prepare for the active shared electric and automated disruptions to the transport system and broader society. As the former strategic partnership manager at Google X and Waymo, he collaborated with cross-functional teams to prepare the commercialization and launch of the world's first fully self-driving ride-hailing service while being fully immersed in the technology. Timothy co-founded City Innovate, a smart city platform matching government and startups to accelerate innovation, and served as the chief innovation officer for San Francisco's transportation agency. This morning, Timothy will explain how the shared electric and automated transition is transforming the movement of people and things. This transition trend has already started and will have a direct impact to the way we fund, manage, and govern our public right of way. Please help me welcome Timothy Papandreou. Thank you so much for that, uh, Colleen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. It's my first time at Yale, so I feel very uh, happy to be here. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Karen and everybody else who organized, Colleen, et cetera, to bring me here. Uh, I know it's a lot of work to do these things, so I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to uh, start the presentation, I think, just by clicking this down button. You'd be amazed how little tech I know as a tech person. Um, so who has been to San Francisco? Has anybody been to, oh wow, everybody's been, okay, a lot of people, okay. So San Francisco is this interesting place where um, a lot of things happen first because we really wanna try everything new. Um, it's a city of 850,000 people um, at nighttime and about two million during the day, but in a region of about nine million people. And they are, they are interested in having, Okay. 
<laughs> Don't worry, happens with everyone's Apple, it's all good. Um, this is an interesting city because a lot of things happen here first because people are just so frustrated with everything all the time. And when I used to work with the city, we used to say that we don't have 850,000 residents, we have 850,000 experts in everything. So uh, this may sound familiar in your area of the, of the world. So a lot of things happen in San Francisco, they're happening in California first. Not because we're smarter, better, or anything like that, it's because we're much more open. We're the most open society in the world, and that's a real key differentiator when you think of why things are happening in certain places and why they're not. It's usually because of the society's openness to trying different and new things, um, in addition to a few other pieces, but that's really the core piece there. So worldwide, we're seeing this massive shift in, in population, and we're seeing not only that we're moving into cities, but the numbers of people moving to cities are pretty astounding. And, and uh, Professor Sito and folks have, this is basically the work that has been done by, by many of you in the room, um, that it's not just that we're, people are uh, uh, becoming much more urban, it's the sheer volume of people that are coming into cities. And we're not building that many more cities, we are building some new ones, but most of the growth is gonna be happening in existing spaces. So the idea that we can move ourselves and our things around in the current forms that we're doing today as the majority way of getting around, it's just, it's simple geometry. Anybody that's done math doesn't work. So we have to change this whole status quo. And technology is really important um, in how we do this because technology is a background foundational product that without it, a lot of these things cannot move forward. And you may recognize some of these symbols, but the bar service for your cell phone, this is the GPS point in the middle, a smartphone, and then the thing on the right is an, is an API or an application program interface. These four things combined make everything work in your day-to-day -day life in terms of the, the technology that you use. So anything that you're using in this phone relies on those four points to actually work. Sometimes we rely on technology too much, and when we see these symbols, uh, people get very upset, especially if you're students in the room. Put your hand up if you don't feel a little bit of anxiety when you see these three symbols. So um, we become a little too reliant on this technology, so we have to really think about it, how we get around. The best technology, we always say, is in the background, not in the foreground. So we all love Wi-Fi, especially when it works, because we can't see it, but we can enjoy it, and we can, we can experience it, and it allows us to do so many other things. But the things that are in your face all the time, and the things that are persistent and pervasive, they're not the ideal uh, users of technology. Now, technology does some social things that we don't like, and there's some technology that does some social things that we really like. We have to remember that it's not the technology, it's actually us. And so this is a typical scene on any train platform around the world. Everyone's on their phone, no one's talking to each other. It's a really anti-social situation. There are equity issues, there are all this stuff, right? It's how we are, because this is how it was 100 years ago, right? <laughs> This is their iPads. These were these iPads. They were three times the size of an iPad, much more space per person. Um, the street scene here, you know, I have so many students and so many um, communities who say, oh, the, the 1910s and 20s, that was the ideal nirvana of cities and it was so amazing, et cetera. Men, white men only, right? Women are at home, not allowed to be outside. No, one, no person of color, gender issues, uh, social segregation issues, all those things are there. It's a really dirty place to live. Cholera is around the corner. Diphtheria is waiting for you in the street over there. So we, yes, the buildings were pretty, but everything else about it was not pretty at all. So this is the best time to be living, folks. If, as bad as you think it is right now, this is the best time. So eventually we're gonna to get to this, um, but we're not there yet. And so we've got, a, we've got a ways to go. And technology is really pervasive in our life right now. It's really part and parcel of everything we do. These six companies basically run a lot of these pieces of our economy. And in our economy, we call these graphs. These are basically key parts of our, 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 our way of life. Google knows about all the world's information. Facebook knows more about you than you do about it. Even if you don't have a Facebook account, if two of your friends have a Facebook account, they know about you uh, more than you do. Um, and LinkedIn knows more about the economy than the world's best economists because of all the chatter that happens between the platforms. Amazon is basically dominating online retail, and there's a fight between Netflix and YouTube, who is the entertainment uh, provider. YouTube went from one in a thousand views a day worldwide to one in four. So it's the world's largest broadcasting corporation, and they're not even a, a broadcasting company. So now the next area of frontier is mobility. Who is going to take on the role of mobility? And 
One thing about all of these companies that I mentioned to you is that their taxonomy is that they work as platforms of data. And what that means is you've heard of platforms, everybody wants to be a platform now, like we want to be a platform this and platform that. Well, the train was the original platform, because actually it was a train platform. Um, but that's the concept, is that things go on it and off the platform, and basically the, the data is captured from it. So how platforms work is that you have providers of services and customers of services, and that interaction point is the platform. And what it does is every time there's something provided, every time there's something that's, that's custom from that, that inflection point is a data point. And the more they can have those interactions, the more data they accumulate. And the more data they accumulate, they start getting very clever with it. And you bring in big data behind that, and all of a sudden you have predictability. And they can more or less predict your next move based on your historical pattern of, of, uh, of movement because we're creatures of habit. So it's pretty, pretty systematized to get that. So transport hasn't really done this uh, very much because it's so fragmented, but it's moving towards that that way of, of working as a, as a platform. And the data is the most important piece of that. Not market share, not revenue, none of the usual economic metrics. It's have we captured the data and can we infer from the data? Because that is what will create the profit path uh, in the future. So I'm going to, I do a lot of VC uh, meetings and we have a lot of investment um, opportunities to come in here about all these projects and pitches. So I'm going to give you this pitch right now. There's a product that's about $35,000. It costs about $9,000 a year to operate. It only gets used 5% of the time, um, so it's 95% of the time is empty. Um, it only uses 20% of its capacity, so 80% underutilized. Um, and we have no idea what the return on investment is. In fact, we think it's going to be negative. Um, guess what this is? It's a car, right? And we have been marketed by this uh, fact for eight decades and we have thrown economics completely out of the window in transport and just focused on this visceral uh, social status need to have this individual transport. And what happens is that we get marketed like this, saying that if you get this car, you're on this beautiful California road because everybody lives in this California road, and you're going to have this. It's going to be amazing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's going to make you sexier, harder, cooler, safer. You're going to be doing less. You won't have your, your protect your children in this vehicle because they'll be safer than everybody else, even though you'll kill everybody else in the street. doesn't matter. All these amazing things. And you buy it and say, yeah, that makes sense, even though I'm going to lose 30% of the value as soon as I get out of the lot. And then everybody does this. And you say, but wait a second. I actually, <laughs> I wanted this, right? And now I'm getting this, because that's the reality. When we all get that individual transport, we have this collective issue, uh, which means massive congestion and everything else. And the sad thing is, this is the school of forestry and environment, and you, care, you guys care about greenhouse gas emissions, is that because we've been over-marketed this idea that SUVs are better for us, even though they're actually wrong on every level, um, they're the second largest uh, growth contributor in GHGs, uh, in the US at least, and in global emissions, sorry. And look at the bar at the bottom. If we actually did focus on those just electric passenger vehicles, not SUVs, we actually would be reducing GHG. So it, there's a real cultural issue in modern versus an environmental or social issue. And here's the other reality as well. We work on this idea that in transportation, we have to build infrastructure, 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 supply, 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 because we're always trying to solve this problem of that individual transport uh, collective issue. The reality is this is a graph that very few transportation people actually use. These are the two peak troughs of demand for, being, for using the, the public right-of-way. We call it the cat's ear diagram because it looks like two cat's ears, right? And those peaks are basically when everybody wants to get out there and everybody wants to get home. And it's only because our work culture, middle managers mostly, require us to shop and put our butt on a seat somewhere. But 90% of these trips are actually not required because you can do the work from home because of that thing called Wi-Fi. We can actually work from home a couple of days a week, and we only need a 5 or 10% shift of people, not 95, a 5 or 10% shift of people to be allowed to work from home a couple of days a week, and all congestion goes away. So that means no more 10-lane freeways needed. So it's not an infrastructure issue. It's not a car problem issue. It's not an individual movement issue. It's a work culture issue. So our work culture is causing all of these issues to become exacerbated. So going to the root cause is a really important thing. Now, cars are a problem. Having too many cars are a problem. Three quarters of our air pollution is because of, of cars. 
1.2 million people are killed every year because of people being silly in cars. Um, we spend 10 days of our lives in cars. So in the US, we get 10 days of vacation, very short vacation window. Um, most of the world gets four weeks. The US gets 10 days. So we're spending just as much time in our car as we do on, on vacation. So that's why we're so stressed out. We never get a chance to rest. Um, and 15% of, of adults who have some sort of disability cannot maintain full-time employment because they cannot maintain a, a physical uh, presence in a vehicle. So we're excluding 15% of what would be incredibly uh, productive uh, employment opportunities to people because they can't operate a, a vehicle, which is ludicrous. So luckily, what we're seeing is a, a sunsetting of the idea that we will be owning our own car in a fossil fuel powered internal combustion engine and insuring it ourselves or riding fixed public transport, that's starting to shift right now. It doesn't mean it's gone away. It's just that the, the, the trend is showing that it's starting to shift. And what we're seeing is a sunrise of what we call a multimodal system where people have more choices to get around in different forms. And it's starting to become uh, much more prevalent, especially in, in cities across the world. But it's a shift, so it doesn't mean that it's happening immediately, and it's not happening everywhere. It's just that it's a, it's a great it's a sign that the signals are starting to shift, which is a really important shift because we cannot have everybody having their own car or waiting for this bus that runs every 30 minutes. There's no alternative to get out of into. You know, many people say in my world, get out of your car and you should shift to something else. But if there's that, that something else is not there, well, what are you shifting out into? Nothing. So you basically go back into your car. So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, big pieces to that. Now, as we mentioned at the start of the presentation, these three megatrends are causing these, these uh, upendings and shifts. The idea that we can share things and not having to own them, which is very anti-American, I know, but we have to start sharing more. It's funny, we teach our kids to share up until the age of like six or seven, and then by 10 years old, they're like not sharing anymore, and as an adult, we don't want to share at all, right? So we have to go back into that learning to share. Um, Electrification is moving forward at, at, at its own pace, uh, and that's moving in a way that's much more technical, so it's going to require a lot of infrastructure. This will be an expensive transition piece. Um, it's also, electric is interesting because electric on its own is not going to solve a lot of things other than make temporary improvements in air quality. Um, it does need the sharing to keep the, the car ownership volume down. And then automated has a lot of promise to show safety and traffic improvements. Um, but on its own, it could actually make things worse. So the three need to actually work together in, in concert to actually ex uh, see the change you want to see happen. And it's interesting, it's not just happening on the passenger side, which is what we focus a lot on, it's happening on the freight side. On the freight side, the reason why it's happening is because there's a bottom line there. It's a clearly a cost benefit to have a much more of a shared electric and automated system. Every dollar Amazon can save on delivery is about a billion dollars on its overhead. So there's a real clear incentive to do that. And they actually may move forward faster than passenger services. So when we add all this mobility disruption together, many of the um, uh, advisory groups suggest that if all of this becomes shared electric and automated and we create this concept called mobility as a service, where you can basically route, book, and pay any transport service any time you want, um, this could be worth up to $10 trillion by 2035. So in about 15 years, a, a much larger system than we have today. So there's a clear economic incentive for all of these technology companies to get really involved and, and work on this very quickly. And we're seeing it happening in all different flavors. There's car sharing, there's bike sharing, there's e-scooter sharing, there's ride hailing, there's transit services, there's all these different services. And they're all coming up in different forms and flavors because there's a lot of opportunity to test uh, and, and deploy the market. In the e-scooter world, the little the scooters, there are over 60 companies worldwide right now that are trying to get into this space. And so it's a really interesting, we call it a Canberra explosion right now of all of these different mobility services. Clearly not all of them are going to make it because just the way the world works, we'll probably have like top three or five in each region. But there's a huge uh, groundswell of, of interest and capital flowing into these areas to try out all these different types of mobility, which for you as a customer is the most exciting time because there's so many things to choose from. Uh, we just have to make sure they actually work. And why they're doing this is because the car traditionally took care of all of the trips. And now we're seeing, we've known this for a while, but this is now why the companies are paying attention. Most of the trips in the US 
are less than five miles. In fact, a good third of the trips are less than two miles, but they're done by car. And they're done by car because we have terrible roads design, we have terrible urban design, and we have terrible land uses. And if we can knit some of those areas together, we can actually see some shift happening. And so many of these technology companies are saying, well, look, for the first two mile trip, scooters and electric bikes work really well. Let's try and find those trips around the, around the country and actually open up those markets. And we're seeing that happen more and more and more. So they're starting to peel away market share from, from personal car trips into more of these different multimodal systems. And then we're seeing a cultural shift happen as well where traditionally marginalized groups uh, all over the world are starting to adopt and adapt to these new forms of mobility because it allows them personal freedom in ways that weren't allowed before. Here's a group in Manila. Women generally are not allowed to ride bicycles or anything that makes them sweat because that's just not seen as, as, as uh, appropriate. And in the Middle East, um, they're not actually allowed to drive cars at all. Uh, in, 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 you know, Saudi Arabia claims to be like, amazing. We've just allowed women to have driver's licenses in 2018. Um, no comments on that on gender issues, but this is an opportunity where they, people can get around and actually still create access, which I think is a really important thing because we had these 80 years ago, folks, um, and the post service used them. This was what helped a lot of the women's suffrage movement is actually be using these motor, motor pads to get around and actually get the vote out. So we've always used transport not just for getting A to B, but for a lot of these cultural and social changes as well. Now, we're seeing electrification move forward in the next area of this, this topic is on electrification. A lot of people predict that we're going to have a massive shift in electrification in the next four or five years as the battery technology becomes much more ubiquitous. It's on its own track. It's going to get there, and I think it's going to be very exciting. The key is, will people actually buy these vehicles? Will they use them? And will people turn over their vehicles? Our cars are made pretty well right now. People hold onto their cars for about 11, 12 years right now on average. So it's going to take a while to turn this over. So this isn't the panacea that Mr. Schumer thinks is going to be the, the, an, the answer for everything. It's part of the solution, not, not the solution. Um, people are buying more e-bikes than they're buying cars, e-cars, because they're lower cost and it's a much faster adoption rate. This is the EU. In China, it's like this. So it's a whole big shift in electric bicycles. You want to help the transportation system, get an e-bike. You want to assist people in your community, figure out how to subsidize e-bikes. It's a much faster uptake. It takes care of the hills. It solves a lot of the issues that people have about bicycling in general, and it's really, really good use of resources. Now, let's shift over to automation. On automation, we have three major areas of automation. We have the movement of people, the movement of things, and the doing of things. And the doing of things is um, the area that's moving the fastest. And it's uh, very closely tied to this school, and I'll get there in a second. So how do we have automation? Uh, really complicated and complex thing to explain, uh, to do really easy to explain. You need a brain, an artificial intelligence. You need machine learning, eyes that can register and understand things. Uh, you need a perception, a sensor suite, you know, ears, uh, sight, feel, touch. And you need to know where you are. You need a map. Um, and if you have those four things, you can pretty much have an autonomous uh, system. Easy to explain, as I said, really hard to do. Um, on the passenger side, we're seeing a lot of these uh, applications right now, whether it's in a small footprint, medium-sized footprint, large-sized footprint, or aerial in a flying, flying taxi type services. All these are starting to be experimented with. They all have their opportunities. They all have their pluses and their minuses. Clearly, the smaller vehicles make a lot more sense for urban areas. Um, the larger vehicles make more sense for like, inner city and, and dense corridors, um, but they all have their own place and space, and the words, the jury's out on what these aerial taxis actually have a value for anything other than very wealthy people. Um, I talked about this last night with a few people in, in the audience. They'll have a place for someone and something, but uh, they may not be the mass transit solution that we want to see happen. On the delivery side, we're seeing a lot of movement in automation because it helps a lot of people, uh, a lot of systems move uh, more effectively. The driver for this is not automation. The driver is e-commerce. And e-commerce is basically trying to shift as much of this into automation and digital because it's a very manual and analog system right now. So long haul logistics, I worked at, at uh, Google Exxon and Waymo. Uh, there's delivery drones that are being applied right now throughout different parts of the country. There's a grocery delivery service in, in Arizona and California called Neuro that delivers your groceries. So the Kroger chain is basically experimenting this with Walmart. There's the Prime Bot and the UPS aerial services that are delivering parcels and 
uh, very timely sensitive organs and medical equipment to hospitals. And then there's some other food services. So they're all starting to play and experiment, but it's a very experimental phase right now that we're doing. The area that's moving very quickly is on the doing things, which is all of the support services, whether it's street sweeping, garbage control, agriculture, mining, forestry, um, and construction, because there's a very simple repetitive task. You're going up and down a line, you're going in a circle, you're coming back out. And they're applying these things uh, for efficiency, for effectiveness, but also for workers' compensation. These are very dangerous jobs. They have a lot of injuries, and they're trying to prevent a lot of the... The, uh, the tasks that are happening that are repetitive and, and, and dangerous. So interesting how they're all coming from different angles, but they're all basically working on the, the automation piece. This is the number of companies that work on automation in the world. Lots of companies. The blue box is moving people. The orange box is moving things. The green box is long-haul logistics. And the red box is everybody just trying to get in the game and figure out how to participate. So a lot of interest. Billions and billions of dollars being invested in this. And so... Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this, how this pans out. How it works is fairly e easy to explain. It has a camera system, a vision system, a sensor system, and a radar system. It needs to basically understand everybody around it. So it asks itself these four basic questions. Where am I? What's around me? What's everybody doing? That's where the brain kicks in, the decision making. And what should I do next, the, the green path of travel? And not all AV companies are the same. The most important thing about AV technology, if you ever get asked or wanting to know about, is it needs to be able to detect, predict, and avoid vulnerable road users. That's the number one need of this technology. If it cannot understand a person walking, a child with their mother or father walking on a street, a person on a bicycle, it's not ready for public roads. So anybody that comes to you and says, hey, look, my AV technology, ask them that question and see if they can answer that question. If they can, then you can allow them to test on your roads. If they can't, they're not ready. Now, interesting about automation is that it's going to shift the way that we perceive transport. So all of you who are car drivers, we are going to shift from being a driver, which is all about the dashboard, to being a rider, which is all about being a passenger. It's a very different experience. And what that means is that all the focus in the car is all about the dashboard. In your meetings, you have dashboard meetings, because dashboard's about the most pertinent information, really quick, quick, quick. We're getting rid of that. It's going to become an experiential service where now it's not about the dashboard anymore. It's about your experience. You can watch movies, watch TV, play games, listen to stuff, go to sleep, um, uh, learn something, do all the things, eat, whatever. The things you shouldn't be doing now that you'll be able to do in these vehicles uh, will, will completely change the, the way that we view autonomous tra transportation. And there's a whole hierarchy of value opportunity from just the vehicles, the technology, but also the different services and providers. So it's a very interesting opportunity. If this moves forward as it's being planned, it's going to not just disrupt transportation services as we know. It's going to disrupt a lot of support services, a lot of those drive-through, drive-in, driving school, all those driving-related stuff are going to go away. So there are implications for our urban uh, fabric because at the last part of this is the land. Our land now will be completely transformed because we won't need parking structures, parking garages, all that half, most of our land that we have, half of it is that dedicated for on-street surface parking of some sort. That will all go away. And so in the end, this actually may be a real estate opportunity rather than a technology opportunity. And we'll see it in different forms. In the central urban cores, we'll see a big mix of multimodal and micromobility. In the suburbs, we'll see a mix of car sharing and ride hailing. But in the outer hinterlands, in the rural areas, we'll have manual driving for a long time because it's just going to be the, 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 the main way to get around. So the whole rural-urban issue will still be the same until we figure out ways to make cooperatives uh, allow for different types of services. Now, in, in the last part of this presentation, it's about the question we have about that's all good and well. It comes, what are we going to do about governance? Who basically is going to manage this? Because these platforms don't like to be governed. They like to be governless. Um, some might say rogue. They want to do their thing, and they keep growing and perpetuating that growth until they dominate the space. And they won't stop, can't stop, until they dominate the space because they're a machine. And we can't afford to have that because we live in a world where we have different types of people, friends, and family, and not everything is the same for everybody. So we need some sort of governance platform, shifting away from, uh, from this discussion, 
where the governor becomes the platform itself. So the adjudicator, the referee, the coach, uh, we don't have that right now. And so we have all of these fits and starts all over the cities and we're seeing knee-jerk reaction with you know, terrible regulation, terrible policy. It's all reactive rather than proactive. It's uh, restrictive and um, prescriptive. Governments should never write prescriptions on how to do innovations, it's not their role. But they should be more permissive and performance-based, saying here are the outcomes we want, help us work towards those outcomes, and if you don't work towards the outcomes, you're off the platform. Very simple. So we allow people to come in, they make mistakes, we sit back and just let it happen, or we don't let certain things come in and we don't see the value. So we need a governance platform in cities, that's what my company is helping a lot of them work on, not just helping understand the digital space, which is huge, privacy issues, uh, digital uh, maintenance, um, storage of data, uh, understanding how to use data and how to talk to data, but also the providers. What are the rules of the providers? How should they interact with, with different people, different services? But also the infrastructure. What do we do with our infrastructure and how do we manage our infrastructure? So the whole governance uh, area is really, really important. And the governance platform needs to have what we call table stakes in tech speak or guardrails. And these guardrails are that you cannot go around these things because these are basically sacrosanct to our, our urban systems. It has to be safe, number one. You have to prove it's safety. It has to be equitable, which is very different from being equal, right? It's not about, being, not about equality, it's about equity. Equity means that every different group has the same access that gets them to the same opportunity, rather than everyone that's given the same amount of information. And the most important thing is that it needs to be interoperable. We have these things called walled gardens where you can only use everything in the Uber app or everything in the Lyft app, but you can't use them together because they want you to stay in their, on their platform. And so we need to make sure that these things are interoperable so that everybody can use them regardless of the, of the, of the opportunity. And they need to be affordable. This cannot be another 1% thing. We need to keep it for everybody. Otherwise, people will be, will be excluded and left out. And we further increase the inequities in our transportation system. And most importantly, it needs to be sustainable, not just from an air quality and an air emissions uh, perspective, but it needs to be financially viable. We cannot continually subsidize our transport systems as we run out of money um, overall. Now, stepping back, it comes down to space. We talked about space allocation before. We have to rethink how we use ourselves in moving ourselves around. Most of us need about one square meter or one square yard of space to move, depending on how much we've had for breakfast. So we need about this much space to move ourselves around. On a micro device, whether it's a bicycle or a scooter or some sort of micro device, we need a little bit more than one, about two in total. And that's a really efficient use of space because now we can move in directions, we can move based on space. The bicycle is actually the most efficient machine ever invented because the amount of calories expended with the distance traveled is the most efficient we have in, in, our, in our history. It's 200 years old, so it's a pretty, pretty amazing technology that's still stayed around. And here is the car. We need, so we call in, in our machine learning, we call these tiles of space. So one X tile for you as a human, about two for micromobility. We need eight of these square tiles just for you to sit in the car. You haven't moved yet, you're just sitting in the car. We need two of those tiles for the engine, four for the five seats that never get used because you only use one of them, and two for the back, which is all the junk in your trunk, right? So, uh, which you never take out. I mean, that's why you have low fuel efficiency because you have too much stuff in your back of your truck. So that eight square meters is just to get in the car. You need another eight square meters to actually travel for a safe distance. So you need 16 times the space of a person walking to go that half mile. Now you understand why you are actually the traffic, right? You are the cause of the traffic, uh, not everybody else. If you, don't, if you get out of your car, you can now point the finger at everybody else, but when you're in your car, you are the traffic. So these are the big shifts we have to do. The ideal is that if we can make it shared electric and automated, we can make it safer, less collisions. If it's electric, um, it can be much more efficient. But if it's safer, it means it can be lighter and smaller. And now we can move you individually in your own little pod, so you don't have to share because you don't want to share, but you don't need those eight square meters of space around you for, for, that, for that need. And here's what it looks like on the street. If we have a street that is just a typical street like this, and we bring in automated vehicles, we're going to have the same situation, same traffic situation, same problems. 
If this is all electric tomorrow, it's the same problems. It's still polluted, it's still congested, because only half of the air quality benefit comes from the actual electric batteries themselves. The other half comes from the wear and tear on the road and the rubber tires burning on the street and the brake pedals. We need to change that, the use of the vehicle as well. When you actually reallocate space on the streets, all of a sudden you give very clear signals now that it's actually safe, comfortable, and convenient to ride a bicycle, to use an e-scooter, or to use some sort of micro bicycle or a cargo bike. It's actually safe, efficient, and convenient now to run frequent transit service. It makes more sense. A bus protected in its bus lane, we can run it more often. We can run it more frequently. We can save money from the public side as well. All these things start making sense. And then the residual space can be given to private tra passenger transport. And you've got plenty of streets to figure this out. You only need one or two of these streets every four or five uh, of the streets to make the system work very effectively. So the majority of the space still gets left over for, for private passenger space, but we're just dedicating a grid for this multimodal system. And you'll be amazed when cities do this, how quickly people who said they'll never ride a bicycle, they'll never take transit, how quickly they shift because it becomes safe, convenient, and fun. When it's fun, everybody wants to do it. This is what it looks like in San Francisco, so we're just not talking about it, they're doing it. And when you allocate space like this, more people travel through the corridor than they did before. This corridor now moves three times the number of people, and it feels much more calm than when it was just for our cars and everybody's stuck in traffic. So you can do this very quickly, uh, very cheaply, just by reallocating space with paint and with uh, temporary signs. But it requires political courage, and that's a, that's a challenge that we have. So how do you do this? Well, you have three ways to do this. You either provide incentives, you either price the system, any economist in the room knows, you just price it and, and people will be rational. Most times, yes, sometimes, no. Um, and then you have to put it, or you put in restrictions. You basically say you can't enter this space if you have a car, a dirty vehicle, whatever it is, right? So cities are experimenting in these three different forms. There's no right answer. The answer is all of these are important and we need to uh, start doing more of it. We have to step back and say, what do we want our transport system to look like? And what do we want our cities to look like? And how do we work towards making those cities uh, the, the way that we want them to? And the challenge we have, though, folks, is that all the money that cities have come from fossil fuel taxes, fares, fees, and fines. And if everybody gets a shared vehicle, if everybody's using a shared electric and automated vehicle, they don't own cars anymore, they're not paying registration. Electric means no more gasoline fuel taxes. And if they're using an automated vehicle, it doesn't need to park anymore. There's no parking spots. No one's breaking the law, no speeding fines, etc. Where does the government get its money for infrastructure? So we have to shift the whole thinking to this idea that we'll, have, we'll seek fair user fees. And those user fees will be based on use of the space. So there's an experiment right now that we're running with a few companies where they're charging the use of the curb per minute, per space, per time. And they're looking to see, can that be the new way of funding transportation to basically offset all the potential losses from these big shifts? And we really can't do it by ourselves, clearly. We need to work much closer with the community, much more community engagement. Uh, companies need to work much more with government and academic institutions like yourselves. But there's a really important shift right now, a real call of action to start working on this because we're seeing the signs everywhere that this is happening. And there is an organization called the New Mobility Alliance, which has developed these 10 shared mobility principles that I'm, I'm actually helping with. And really the core message here is that this is a place to start the dialogue and start the engagement. And there's a group that, as was mentioned in my intro, City Innovate, where we work very closely with technology companies and with cities to help them articulate these problem sets. Because the number one issue that cities have actually come back to us saying is that we love all these ideas. We don't have the staff capacity in-house to actually do this. We need staff capacity training, we need behavioral science uh, information, we need data science training, all those new areas that don't exist in cities right now. So I want to thank you so much for your time and really appreciate this. So you've got to walk the talk and you've got to, I call it riding the talk. This is riding the talk. So uh, please uh, uh, look forward to the rest of the day's conversations and thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Right on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
the transformations you talked about are exciting. In the aggregate, they're going to be beneficial for society. They will also create losers. You know, one of the largest occupations in this country, for example, is truck drivers. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you said, much of uh, the real estate market is based on single occupancy vehicles. What do we do with the losers? Yeah, so uh, there's a misperception that we're going to have a lot of job losses in transportation. Um, it's a transition period, so this is not going to happen tomorrow. If this happened tomorrow, we'd, we'd lose those 4.1 million jobs. But it's going to happen over a decade, and it's probably going to be a little bit longer than a decade. Here's what's interesting about the Trucking Association. I work with them very closely. They cannot keep people in the industry, and they have a massive shortage right now. No one under the age of 30, 30 years old wants to drive a truck anymore. It's just a, it's a very hard job. It's long, it's tedious, it's, very, it's, it's really bad on your back, etc. Many of the kids of truck drivers have said, I'm never going to do this job because I never see, never see my dad or my mom. So they're having a massive shortage issue right now as it is. And they're the ones who are pushing for automation because what automation will do is it'll extend the range of the driver while the technology gets better and better and better. And the driver now can drive for about eight hours before they have to basically get out of the vehicle. This will allow them to rest while the vehicle does more of the work for them, and it'll keep them in the job longer. Um, the attrition rate will hopefully be also something that we're addressing as well. In the automotive space, the same thing. There's going to be so many other things that are going to be needed to do these services. We don't have anywhere near the number of maintenance people and maintenance services that these systems will need right now. And so the jury is out whether we'll actually lose any jobs um, in, the, in, in the interim. Over the long term, the jobs will shift, but it'll be a similar situation like the 1920s. We had all these horse carriage drivers and horses went away, we had cars, and they became taxi drivers very quickly, but it took a 10-year transition. None of this technology is going to happen tomorrow. It's, it's really on a 10-year minimum track, so it's going to be enough time to, to, the idea is that there'll be enough time to transition people out. Yeah, it's a good question, though. Yes. Hi. So thank you for the brilliant lecture. Um, I really enjoyed your ideas. And um, I'm, my question is actually what if you could see a city like New Haven, which is relatively small mm -hmm. and flat during this transition. And um, I, I guess my my question is similar. Like, what's the time frame and if it's doable in with any type of culture within, you know, I'm just talking about United States, but still yeah. we have a mini culture here in New Haven. Yeah, yeah, so a really good question. So I walked around New Haven, I had a quick look. I came by train, so I got to see how it connects with the train station. You have all the bones here, all the right mix. You have envious land uses, envious street design. Most regions in the world don't have this. You don't have, you just need the political support to reallocate the space in the street, to do what that's in that photo. If you can put in the green bike lanes and the red bus lanes where you need them, a lot of this stuff will happen for you. So you don't need to wait for automation. You don't need to wait for electrification. Those things will happen in the background. But what you, what you need to do as a city, as a city to focus on change, is to allocate the space so that people of all ages and backgrounds and even cultures feel comfortable enough to try out these, uh, these different services. Because you'll have excuses of weather, of rain, of age, of ability, of all these different things. And they're right if the street looks just like the way it does today, where cars are going too fast, it doesn't feel safe to cross those streets, and that's really space allocation, paint, and these posts. And these things cost thousands of dollars per mile, not millions of dollars per mile. So it's a priority of the budget in the city and a priority of the, of the, of the politics. And unfortunately, that's the message. It's not, a tech, it's not a technology issue, it's not a cultural issue, it's a priorities issue. And we have the money. It's already there in the budget for this. Yeah. Any city can do this. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I'm going to ask us to hold the rest of the questions uh, so we can get to our next panel. But please talk to Timothy over coffee break and lunch, and I, um, I'll be thanking him again. Thank you.
Oh, are we supposed to toggle it on when we talk, or do you want us to? Yeah. So then my guffaws will be heard. Nice. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've already spilled coffee this morning, so what? I've already spilled coffee. I'll try not to spill this water. <laughs> Thanks. You have to turn it on too. <laughs> or I guess when it's okay. Okay, I think yeah, sure. in the interest of keeping the schedule moving, we are going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, my name is Kate Cooney. I am a senior lecturer in social enterprise and management at the Yale School of Management. I teach a class there on urban poverty and economic development. And I'm really excited to be moderating this panel and the kind of spirit of the day uh, which is to bring together Yale University faculty from different disciplines to investigate this topic of, of, of urbanization. And, and our topic for our panel is uh, the inequities of, of urbanism. Uh, so it gives those of us who are working in this area a chance to speak with each other, uh, which is really exciting. And so for the first part of the panel, we'll be doing that. We'll be talking to each other. And then we are going to leave a lot of time to also engage with all of you uh, for the second half of the panel. Uh, so in the spirit of that interdisciplinarity, we have uh, Eric Harms from uh, the Department of Anthropology. Eric's work focuses on the uses and abuses of culture and urban civility in urban Vietnam and how this civilizing discourse entwines with spatial action in ways that legitimize broad-scale privatization. His research explores how the study of social space can reveal unspoken relationships of power and ideology in post-reform era Vietnamese cities. We have Elihu Rubin from the School of Architecture. Elihu's work focuses on the built environment of the 19th and 20th century cities, history and theory of city planning, urban geography and the cultural landscape, transportation and mobility, architectural preservation, heritage planning, and the social life of urban space. And last but not least, we have David Sleiker from Yale Law School. David's work focuses on state and local elections, the relationship between local government law and agglomeration economics, and the pathologies in land use politics and procedure. All right. Hmm. So, Elihu, I'm going to start with you. Okay. <laughs> 2,500 years ago, Plato wrote, any city, however small, is in fact divided into two. One, the city of the poor, and the other, the rich. Why, two, two and a half thousand years later, are we continuing to express concern about inequality in cities. Cities are in, a part, are in part unequal because through patterns of migration and immigration, they manage to both attract skilled and unskilled people, which is in some ways a reflection of the strength of, of cities. Are there good reasons to be concerned about high levels of inequality? Right, well, thank you, I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we haven't gotten ourselves out of the predicament that Plato uh, identified 2,500 uh, uh, years ago. And, uh, it's some, and that's, that's why we're here. There's incredible uh, inequality and in some places becoming more unequal. What Plato um, called the two cities, we also sometimes refer to as the dual city. Um, you have places within the city that are better connected to other cities than they are to their own neighbors. Um, there are issues of social space involved here. Physical space and social space don't always, uh, don't always coincide. Um, and there are issues uh, 
partly to do with, with the market generating inequalities, and there are issues to do with, with government uh, creating and reinforcing those inequalities. I mean, when you teach the history of the American city, it can be a very brutal history. It is the story of um, the consistent production and reproduction of inequality. I think one of the most shocking um, episodes that we share with our students is during the New Deal, which so many of us admire and so many incredibly bold programs in articulating uh, uh, the role for a progressive public realm, they're also creating uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation that is producing residential security maps that are redlining parts of the city. Um, those areas often then become the, the areas of the city targeted for urban redevelopment in the 1950s and 60s because we've starved them of, of capital. Um, this gets to part of the issue around, you know, that Timothy raised too, around government regulating or innovating. That, that really was not a productive innovation uh, at that time, and we're still clawing our way out of some of the inequalities that government, in often in explicitly racist, racist ways, um, has had impacts on the inequalities in, in our cities. So one of the concerns is the way that previous moments of um, inequality get encoded into the, into the built environment, and that then becomes this kind of motor that continues to perpetuate and, and continue Absolutely. and even compound. Absolutely. Yeah. David, so, jump in. So we, we wouldn't want cities to be perfectly equal. It would be a profoundly bad thing. If you want to look at a place that has a low Gini coefficient, you can look at Westport, Connecticut. It's, an, it's completely equal and completely rich. <laughs> um, that um, the idea of um, cities attract uh, people of all sorts because they are big economic engines and they are places where people of all economic types can come. That we're, the, the, the American mechanism for generating urban inequality is largely exclusion. So we can exclude people from areas and keep our neighborhoods extremely equal in housing type and in wealth, um, but the poor people don't go away just because they're not in town. They go to the exurban fringe, they go to other areas of the country, um, and this really, the, the desire to export poverty for property tax reasons or other reasons uh, is a, um, is a, drives uh, a lot of national inequality. Um, access to our richest job areas in San Francisco, New York, LA, Boston. We've, uh, we've created land use restrictions that have made it extremely hard to build housing, which keep people out of them, that generate, drives a lot of national inequality but ironically, of course, in many towns, it increases uh, e equality on some level inside the city. So the ci uh, the, the, uh, a city that has all types, a city of rich and poor, is the sign of a healthy society rather than a sign of an unhealthy society because it means the city is accommodating people from all income streams. Mm -hmm. I just want to jump in, Kate. Um, you asked why it's persisted for so long. I think one of the issues is those in control of the city making processes tend to be the, those who are already in positions of power. And there's systematic forms of occlusion that happen that um, ignore the, the city inhabiting qualities of people who are outside of those systems of power. So uh, you could see this, the reason in my research I focus on a civilizing process is in Vietnam, in contemporary Vietnam. You have urban planners who never set foot into different parts of the city who are making major decisions that are ultimately transforming those parts of the city, um, often in their own minds based on kind of ideas of you know, disrupting uh, urban development or redeveloping things in all kinds of ways. And there's an inherent kind of civilizing logic to that, that they will deliver a new form of inhabiting to the city. And that's the same exact discourse that French colonial uh, uh, authorities used when they came to Vietnam and delivered civilization in the mission civilisatrice to, to Vietnam. So I think we can see these patterns of kind of well-intentioned experts who are planning to deliver new ideas to cities, but we also have to bring in the other half in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we have a dual city, we need both sides of the city at the table working on those kinds of new solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Eric, just to stay with you for a minute, um, in your book, you talk about the luxury and, and the rubble. Right. Um, and <clears throat> so you, you intentionally bring in two different standpoints on these, these economic developments. Can you talk about the different sort of perspectives on the, the mm -hmm. big development and, uh, projects that you're, yeah. that you're looking at? 
So, so my research is about master planned urban development projects that are coming into places like Vietnam. So you have a kind of historic urban fabric with uh, tight alleyways. Actually, you can't drive a car into an alleyway, so because of that, you have all kinds of uh, interesting people ride motorbikes because you can park a motorbike in your living room and those kinds of things. Um, and there's a new development of these master planned urban developments, which in one way is designed with the intention of liberating people from the intense density of, of these kind of difficult to live in, hot and otherwise difficult cities, um, but in the process delivers inequity. Um, and also transforms the footprint of the city in radically new ways and requires automobiles and bigger houses and, and those kinds of and larger commutes. There's a separation of work and home. What Timothy had talked about before about the new uh, technological economy delivering the possibility to work from home. Well, in Vietnamese cities for, throughout the 20th century, people were working from home. It's actually new innovations which are actually leading people to a kind of new separation. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, the thing that I'm interested in is the way in which good intentions to deliver a kind of new civility to the city actually is often entangled with unexpected consequences and inequities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can, can I jump into and respond a little bit to what David said? Because uh, I think that is a very powerful argument. We don't want places necessarily that, that um, that equality in and for its own sake is not the answer, and I think that's true, but the problem with that argument, it seems to me, is that it ends up justifying inequality in places. The point is to make the poor people less poor, not to celebrate places that have inequality because they seem to tolerate so much difference. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right. On the other hand, that the, um, the, the, the broader point is to say that something like uh, equality, uh, looking at income inequality as a statistic for a city is not a sign of its mm. health. And you can't, you, again, because again, you, what you'll find is Menlo Park, or you can find places of deep, deep, deep poverty, all of which will show up as very successful along mm. s uh, something that looks at income growth mm -hmm. or wage growth would be a much healthier way of understanding the, the con contribution of the city to broader concerns about economic inequality and growth, right? right? So the cities turn out to be places where you see much higher wage growth um, than, uh, than uh, rural areas. Um, and similarly, certain cities have much higher wage growth across all job categories. So the, um, again, if we built affordable housing in, uh, pick your Silicon Valley of choice, silly city of choice, Cupertino. Um, that would radically increase that city's inequality, but it would be good for national inequality because mm -hmm. it would give access to the job market to the best job market in the world, um, or one of the best job markets in the world at least, um, uh, to a huge number of people who are currently living in you know, uh, places with less economic mm -hmm. opportunity. And that exclusion is a source of national inequality or international right. inequality, which are the things that we really should care about. And the, it's local manifestation. Let me give an example. If you were looking at the inequality in New York City, very unequal place, the tale of two cities, as Bill de Blasio noted. If New York City, uh, if the Bronx seceded from New York City, New York City becomes a radically more equal place in all senses except any sense that's important. Mm. Right? So the Bronx wouldn't cease to exist. And still be there, still be deeply poor relative to the rest of the city. It just wouldn't be part of the political definition that we give to New York City. Similarly, if the New York City metropolitan region um, uh, does not build enough housing, there would be a whole number of people who live in, say, a nearby region, uh, New Haven, um, that uh, could have access to a better job market and don't. So the, 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 the point is that the statistic or the, the right. me mechanisms of thinking about urban inequality, mm. we want places that, get pla that incorporate uh, the poor, immigrants, et cetera, because they are economic engines, and that that will contribute more to the things we really should care about, which are uh, not defined exclusively by geographic boundaries. Can I just interject on, on this point? I, yeah. I, you could take the same model. This is a question of scale. To uh, what level do you measure equity or inequality, right? So uh, if you have Westport, you could make an analogy at the national level. Let's look at Singapore in relation to Malaysia. Um, at one time, they, they were the Malayan Federation, right? Um, but at, when Singapore separates from Malaysia, all of a sudden, within Singapore, you have a kind of mini Westport. And you don't have to deal with rural urban differences. You don't have to deal with vast hinterlands. Um, so the Singaporean model of extraordinary 
economic growth in terms of itself, you can look at it and say, well, they've achieved a certain kind of interesting model of social housing and all these kinds of things. But in the process, you look at Singapore in the region of Southeast Asia and you have extraordinary inequality and Singapore is extracting resources from across the region. So we have to include the externalities, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. of inequality when we look at the equality that's developed yeah. within a particular place. No, I, I, think. I, I think that's a great point because we, we do have a lot of barriers to effective regional planning where many of the, the measure, measures should be looked at regionally in Connecticut and so much of New England. Um, you know, we have all of these small little municipalities. They're very much sources of, of exclusion and not inclusion. Uh, for many years, there were people even here at, at Yale who were advocating uh, forms of regional tax sharing that would actually acknowledge the fact that the suburbs benefit so much from the city but, but don't contribute in that way. In fact, they often flee to avoid paying the taxes. Um, and this, again, is, is an opportunity for innovation in governance, I would say, um, to be able to think more, um, more effectively about regional governance systems. They, they really are, are uncommon in the United States. There are some. There is a regional cog, they call it, of some, a congress of, I don't know exactly what it stands Cancel. for. Yeah, um, but but they don't end up end up doing very much. And uh, you know, out west or other places, you may have large unincorporated county lands, and they have different. Uh, and some of the regional areas are are larger. But especially in Connecticut and in New England, all of our ancient little municipalities are often a, a barrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David, I want to follow up with you on the changing sort of patterns of the way inequality lays out not only um, a rising inequality overall, but also a rising inequality between regional economies. So we had a kind of long convergence between American city and regional metro economies. And then since 1980, we've seen this uh, flip, this, so there's this, this future. There's this famous finding that state, the average GDP per state, or GSP per state, or the per capita, was converging for 100 years from 1870 to 1970. Um, the poorest Mississippi was getting relatively closer to Connecticut and Delaware. And this was driven by two things. One was people were moving from one place to another, and the other one was capital was flowing in the other direction. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the, what we've seen since 1980 is that that has stopped, or slowed, and then stopped. Um, and today, in fact, the, you're seeing greater divergence, that the New Jersey's, Connecticut's, Delaware's, Maryland's of the world are getting richer per capita relative to um, the poorest states. And this is a source of national political conjunction, and it's a, but it's, a, it's also a, uh, a sign of a really, really broken um, uh, um, uh, system of uh, uh, national and regional government. So part of it is just broader things one might think about inequality that, that just are felt locally, right? So that if rich, if the incomes of the rich go up, then the incomes of the places where rich people live go up. And so that's in a, in one set of policy concerns that when you can, it's kind of, I don't know how native it is to this discussion. Um, but the, a whole variety of these things are driven by the fact that we've made it harder for people to move to places. And so I've talked about one, which the, the, probably the biggest one, which is housing limitations. Um, uh, there's just not enough housing in the places where we need houses such that people can move there. But it's a lot of other things. So it's um, occupational licensing restrictions, which uh, about 25% of American workers are governed, need an occupational license to work. That's dr almost all regulated by the state or city level. They're almost never interoperable. So that if you are registered as a, you have a, you're a lawyer in one place, you have to take a whole new test to be a lawyer in another place. Sim only across a huge number of professions, including not just high-end professions, but hair braiding, famously. Um, uh, it's also true for a lot of public benefits. So uh, just because you get benefits in one place doesn't mean that if you move, you'll get benefits in another place, another place which means is an extreme disincentive to move. Um, uh, we've created lots of barriers to people moving. These barriers are felt much more on the lower end than the higher end. And they limit the ability, and they, this, this creates a much more regionally unequal country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eric, in the, in the Vietnamese case, do you see the rise of these luxury zones also attracting sort of low, low skill labor mm -hmm. to that same region? The, or how, what's the dynamic there? How, how I mean, planned? The dynamic is, is really extremely fascinating, multi level. So, in Vietnam, you have a regional divide in you know, North Vietnam and, and 
where I, where I do my research is in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, you have massive injection of capital from Hanoi-based elites, uh, often um, cadres, party members who have uh, gotten their money through uh, nefarious means. Uh, so there's massive just planting of money into real estate developments, these master plan developments because they're made by corporations. You don't have to deal with individual homeowners to buy and sell and create the kind of networks that you need to have a trustworthy uh, you know, real estate transaction. People can be sitting up in Hanoi and just buy like 10 apartments down in Saigon to, you know, launder their money essentially, to put money in, in a particular place. So you have that, but then you have these large scale, um, what they call in Vietnamese a spontaneous urban development that emerges on the periphery of these zones um, with people who can't afford to purchase property within there, but they're doing all the services. So you have the kind of dynamic relationship uh, between informal housing and informal development that's often being built in wetlands in kind of precarious ways mm -hmm. and these new urban developments as well. Um, so that's, uh, yes, it's attracting, but it's attracting in forms that actually reproduce the inequity. Mm -hmm. And we talk, and some of the issues about land use are really important too because you have basically people who are now buying and sell, buying three houses in ways that are completely unnecessary that are adding to the footprint of the city um, and adding to resource use, um, pushing out and driving up property for those uh, informal housing developments at the same time. So it's creating a very volatile situation mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Elihu, we've also, ha as you mentioned, we had uh, this period of, of urban renewal uh, that, that's kind of resonating with the story that, that Eric is, is telling mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam. What, what were some of the ideologies driving that, that uh, period of, of urban renewal, and what are the lessons yeah. that we, is there a consensus about the lessons that we've learned from, from that I think that for, for a long time there was a consensus that the mechanisms of condemnation and clearance were, were cruel, were unnecessary, were myopic in terms of the inability to recognize sustaining urban environments and condemning them as slums and blighted areas. Um, it was this, the hubris of the best and the brightest. Um, and I think planning has come way back from that and become much more modest in um, thinking about how to um, work with communities to advocate for, for communities and to work in a, in, in a more equitable fashion. And yet, we empathize to a degree with the planners responding to the city, T Timothy, that you uh, showed there. It's easy to romanticize the late 19th and early 20th century city, mm -hmm. but there were decades and decades of urban reformers that looked at the conditions of the working classes in the city, for example, or looked at the mix of industry and housing and said, we have to solve this, we have to fix this. Um, there were many examples. Um, Americans in the United States were very inspired by interwar Germany, for example, where they start producing modern housing estates. Um, and they really were sincere, um, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these people. Um, but ultimately, um, what happened was extremely traumatizing to cities. And we've also come back to, to rethinking the forms of mobility that were championed there, which was driving highways into the hearts of our city, um, ripping up uh, uh, trolley tracks, incredible optimism around the bus service in New Haven, the last trolley ran in 1948. The buses were brilliant. You could shift the, the, mm -hmm. the route anytime you want. You could extend it further into the suburbs. There's incredible optimism around that. Um, but now as we rethink the highways and we think about restitching, we've come 180 degrees. Um, now, some of us do admire and appreciate some urban redevelopment landscapes. We kind of um, acknowledge a sort of original sin, and yet can we still look in awe at the Knights of Columbus building here mm -hmm. in New Haven, which I yeah. personally am in awe of, although many people hate it. I'm curious what you think about that, too. It's a love-hate kind of, kind of situation. So my generation of architectural historians are, are reevaluating urban renewal landscapes to see how they grow and, and change and how they've actually, actually been, been lived in. Um, but, but tremendous inequalities were formed uh, during that, that time, despite initial optimism around the progressive, progressive ideas. Just one last thing, I know I'm going a little bit too long on this, but you know, one of the things the progressives were responding to were, were slumlords. 
um, were, were people that were a, a lot of absentee landlordship, um, and that government could step forward and innovate here and provide good housing for, for people. Because of some of the perceived failures of urban renewal, the feds and the government stepped way back. Um, this is why some people romanticize even Robert Moses, because at least he stood for a powerful role for the public realm. Now we've stepped way back, and mm -hmm. what issues do we have? In New Haven today, we have a slumlord problem again, and we have the Livable Cities Initiative doing their best to keep them in check. Um, but we traded a lot of some good ideas. Some historians are trying to resuscitate Ed Logue to say, hey, he was trying to do mm -hmm. some, some good things here. Can we put a good place for the public realm? Can we reinsert that into the discourse and kind of shake off the hangover of, of urban uh, re renewal? Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, the, the new Ed Logue book, it's, it's you're refer, refer, referring right. to, it's, um, mm -hmm. I thought it was a horror, the book. Um, and uh, the, horror. A horror, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> because it, what it doesn't do is, it, I mean, it, 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 it valorizes intentions over out outcomes. Right. Mm -hmm. At no point does the book or the kind of new Logian, there are other, uh, to talk about the actual success of places rather than talk about their intentions, which were admittedly good. And, and of course, built, birthed in these buildings. So uh, Logue, a son of Yale, Yale Law School, uh, trained by Yale, Law School, Yale, Yale University planners. Um, uh, and at no point in any of the sections does it actually reckon with the fact that almost all of them were uh, like real disasters. Mm. And so not only that, they went bankrupt. It, 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 like, it, the book treats as a footnote the fact that the urban development company, which it talks about its line, actually went bankrupt because it was not a sustainable form for it. And so it's one of these things that, um, that uh, is a, that I, the, the, the new, the kind of new romance of the, the kind of revival of the urban renewal movement still to my mind hasn't reckoned with its, the, the, with outcomes rather than inputs. I, I just want to add, I think the lesson cross-culturally, uh, the New Haven story, the Ed Logue story, is, is really a lesson of hubris, actually, the, and, and a lesson in the need for incremental thinking. Um, a lot of the, like, you can, you can read the Ed Logue book and discover good intentions, right? And you can see the same thing in French colonialism, too. You can see the same thing in contemporary Vietnamese urban planners. You can see it in Chinese planners. You can see it across the world, these kind of expert planners who have good ideas. It's not like an inherent evil inside the city that's designed to go out and destroy the lives of others, right? But there is a hubris that I think needs to be checked and to be slowed down a little bit too. And like, so we can appreciate aspects of mid-century modernism. Who doesn't like a great mid-century modernist coffee table, for example? But at the same time, you have to recognize that not every coffee table in the world has to be mid-century, and then all previous existing coffee tables needed to be destroyed, right? And I think what we need to get back to is ability to appreciate different perspectives and think about on the neighborhood level, maybe perhaps uh, incremental development objectives, um, but slow down a little bit as we try uh, and tried some experiments, but without an in internalize the possibility for recognizing the failure of an experiment I too. I add that one thing, <clears throat> that our property markets in the United States are the most, or probably our most single most regulated market in many ways. The, the idea of a, <clears throat> that we would, that uh, you, even compared to countries we think of as much more interventionist. So we, demand of both the uses and separate the uses and uh, put limits on uh, the, uh, the heights and densities of buildings to a far greater degree than basically you see anywhere else in the world. Um, that uh, the one central planning institution in America is the local zoning board. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, is a, it's a real problem. And it, it, it's, uh, it's, it, I, don't, I don't know, it's not driven by the same type of hubris as the, the, the master plan, right? So mm -hmm. the, the citywide, regionwide. Um, but it does re re require a belief in a greater knowability of what's good than I, uh, or what will create a sustainable urban form than I, um, I, I believe that people have. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, a, that's a good point. And, uh, and yet I think that one of the big issues there is not, not necessarily so much the mechanisms as the way they're communicated to people mm -hmm. um, and people's perception 
that they are, they're not in control of their own streets and their own neighborhoods. They're wary now as we come back to some of the uh, obsolete zoning code and we attempt to create new zoning overlays or, or to unlock development potential in some areas by reducing some of, the, um, some of the restrictions, you have people in the neighborhood and on the street say, we don't want you to unlock the development potential here. We don't want you to be making these uh, decisions to allow outside capital to come in to pull even more capital out of the neighborhood. And there's a lot more work that can be done that's communicative so that, that people um, not only feel but actually um, participate in some of these decisions. And I agree that that is something that, um, that we still, still, uh, still deal with, the, the power, the intoxication of expertise. This is why you know, some of the smart city discourse, and Tim, this must relate to your, your work uh, as well, is very worrisome to me because now we say we don't need to make any more decisions. We can let the computer figure everything out and mm -hmm. essentially displace the politics of actually making decisions um, and allow some, um, some algorithm to decide how to, how to run things for us. I get very worried about that, that kind so of stuff. The one thing though is that I think we should also be worried about incremental increases in participation. So mm -hmm. if you look at participation rates, who participates, it's actually way less equal than voting. So the people mm -hmm. who, who have time to show up at a local zoning board meeting are yeah. old, rich, and white. Much older, much richer, and much whiter than the average population because that's who has time to go to planning board meetings. And even modest increases in participation will show those. In, there's a great new book, uh, Kate Einstein's book, that shows that she went to every single planning board meeting in the Massachusetts for a long period, and they, they got the records. And it's really striking how dramatically unequal participation is because participation is just really expensive. Right, so it's just a really expensive form compared to other forms of political control. And so, I the the if what more more community participation means is more open meetings, um, I think that's bad. Yeah. Um, I do think that you could we could innovate in the ways in which we do participation. So surveys um, or uh, or um, and further, the other thing I'd say is that the thinking about the neighborhood or even the block as the constituent element in which we need to represent yeah. is itself, I think, problematic because um, it uh, automatically, by its nature, privileges insiders over outsiders. So that the person who wants to live on that block doesn't go to the planning meeting. They're not there. They're not there yet. Yeah. And so mm. the the focusing right. on there's a real conflict between uh, participation driving and neighborhood planning and the regional planning yeah. things you were talking but, about. You know, David, that's a point very well taken. But the problem is, is that we run into this issue where we think that more participation is bad. I mean, this is the problem with the rhetoric of some of these arguments. It's the same thing around the rhetoric that uh, more inequality of cities is is good. Um, you need to really explain what you're saying, um, and as you have, um, but but you know, but but it's it's a problem. You don't want to get into a situation where we say more participation is bad because only elites are participating. Um, we need to find a way, just as you say, to make participation as democratic as possible, to be as invitational as possible. Yes, that's that's the problem, and thus public meetings have a bad name with politicians mm -hmm. and developers. They hate public meetings because they know the same old cranks are going to show up and have the same old. <laughs> stuff mm -hmm. you know and that's what right. right. many of us are here yeah. today you know but, but. Well, I'd, I'd add to that too that public meetings uh, from the neighborhood perspective often have this kind of a bad reputation as a kind of a, a, a public listening to the expert session often you know and so mm -hmm. especially in other parts of the world where dif there's different levels of civic participation and actually uh, actual electoral democracy doesn't necessarily always exist right um, and so these things will be often portrayed as a, a getting the ideas from from local neighborhoods or something um, and that's what appears in the report to the international development donor or something but in fact that was a that was a session in which the whole neighborhood was forced to gather so they could take some photographs and then they were told what was coming next week. Mm -hmm. right, right. Yes, that happens all the time. So, so we've talked a lot about uh, the sort of history, uh, how we got to, to this current moment, um, some of the misalignment of incentives. What do you think are going to be the key mechanisms driving inequities going forward? Uh, let's start with the U.S. case. I mean, are these kind of current agglomeration economics just representative of an early moment in a new industry and we're going to see some 
kind of spreading out again amongst uh, other cities and in a, in a a, a turn towards convergence, or what do you what do you think are some of the underlying Probably mechanisms? Not. I mean, again, I, one of the things is like it's like if you could predict uh, the exactly where the economy is going, I recommend leaving here and buying stock or something. Um, you know, <laughs> it's going to be a more profitable way to go about. It. One thing I'd say is that people had a lot of expectations that technology would be anti-urban and anti-superstar urban. That people would. Uh, stop moving to New York and move out to Wyoming where they'd have space and they'd telecommute. Um, but it's turned out thus far that most information technology has been uh, urban supporting rather than urban. And if you think about what you use information technology for, it's largely for setting up meetings. Um, Sadly, um, it's a, uh, 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 it's a, but you know, you send an email, do you want to meet for drinks? Well, if there's no one around for drinks, that's not really all that useful a technology. Um, um, and the, um, the, 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 even the belief in working from home has largely, I mean, there, there's been some small increases, but there's been a lot of counter trends also that you've seen people, uh, especially for higher end workers, desiring more in-person contact because there's a belief that people are going to learn from one another um, uh, uh, through semi-random convert, the famous example, putting the bathroom at the end of the hall so everyone has to walk and meet one another. So I don't see any reason to expect a, a, a divergence of economic activity. I think the question is, can we bring everyone into it rather than attempting to figure out where economic activity should go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is not really a satisfying answer, but the drivers of inequality are the government and the corporations. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you see it today, they're, they're, we're, we continue to commit crimes against our own population, uh, like when the, government of, when the governor of Michigan uh, authorized the, uh, the switching of the water system in uh, Flint from Detroit to the Flint River, there are now reports we've poisoned a generation of people there. That was a poor decision by, by government, um, where, we've, where we've poisoned our own, our own citizens. Um, and we have issues where corporations are still seeking um, to exploit labor as best they can. Um, and the issues of mobility are really key here. When they pick up and when GM picks up and leaves from Lordstown, you can't expect those people to be commuting five hours or to move their entire families. Mobility, to me, is one of the most crucial lenses on this physical mobility, uh, social mobility of, of different fo forms. They're completely unevenly um, distributed. Uh, the people who can choose to work from home in some cases or can, or can telecommute from, from Wyoming and those that have very, very uh, uh, limited forms of mobility, the divergence continues to get bigger and bigger. The winning cities are really winning, and, and their problem, Boston, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, um, uh, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., other such cities, their problem is affordability, displacement, and gentrification. Um, gentrification now has a bad name, but, uh, but if Youngstown, Ohio could get some of that gentrification, meaning investment, it would be a very, very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's going, going to take um, a lot of efforts to, um, to, uh, to, to persuade, um, in some sense, corporations to make longer lasting commitments and then to build from the grassroots opportunities mm -hmm. in places like that and to build the, the next generation of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in those places. Yeah, it, I, seem, I, it seems like yeah. this, this divergence has implications for where distribution occurs as well, right? If, if, it's, if, if it's happening, at, if a lot of redistribution is occurring at the state level and we have this rising inequality between states and cities, it's yeah. not as effective oh, as yes, if it yes, was a national. Yeah. It's, it's right. absolutely the case that right. we, we run a huge amount of our social welfare system through state governments, and if we're seeing great increasing inequality in the incomes in those state governments, uh, the capacity of a place like Mississippi to do redistribution, not that they have a lot of uh, uh, desire necessarily, but um, their capacity is much lower, and so that we see, um, and the same thing is true at the, lo at the local government level, that uh, you can redistribute all you want inside Westport, doesn't really matter all that much to uh, broader problems of, um, of, of economic inequality. And this is going, this likely, by the way, will get worse rather than better. Um, we're in a, there's a lot of belief that in the next recession, we're going to see a large number of uh, state and local governments facing very, very, very severe fiscal problems, including the jurisdiction in which we're sitting. Um, uh, um, heavily underfunded pension programs, large mm -hmm. amounts of bonded debt, um, uh, the capacity of those jurisdictions to do uh, really very much of anything is going to be sub substantially restricted. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just yeah. add here, uh, add to what both of you said, um, but focus on the corporate aspect. I, I think um, the, 
the, the role of major corporations in urbanization and urban development around the world, in the United States, it's quite obvious in, in many ways, but around the world, it, it's important too. I have a colleague up at um, Northeastern in, in Boston who, who's an Asia, Asia scholar who works on um, urbanization. He's an urban studies expert, and he has a new book called The Real Estate Turn in Urban Planning. And basically what he's talking about is the, the degree to which urban planning across Asia not just Vietnam, but all over, like from India to uh, China to uh, Philippines, is increasingly run by uh, real estate uh, imperatives. Mm. And so the, the planning, like, and, and this, this has very serious consequences for uh, you know, democratic civil society and governance. I mean, you can, in some cases, um, these real estate companies ha have good intentions and, and you kind of depend on the benevolence of the real estate developer. If you're lucky, you get good ones who want to create uh, smart cities, walkable cities, or new urban deliver new urbanism and transport connections. On the other hand, you get other people who are just basically rapacious real estate developers who will do anything to make a buck, right? And when planning decisions previously were in the hands of democratically elected civic boards and planning boards or urban planning departments, theoretically you could respond to that as an electorate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're losing a lot of that in the, in the co contemporary world. So th that's one of the dangers that I see. Um, but it's also an opportunity in some cases. In the Vietnamese case, I'll say that a lot of people I know, when you talk to them on the street, they're quite happy that corporations are taking over because they're sick and tired of the single party state and the way it's gone about urban development, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there needs to be an increasing dialogue between that because of the way in which some people are willing to cede so much development to corporations in the short term, you can't necessarily predict what will happen in the long term. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. I mean, that's sort of a there's nothing new under the sun sort of situation here. I mean, what the critical history of urban planning are elites hiring experts like the Commercial Club of Chicago hiring Daniel Burnham in order to create a plan that substantiates additional accumulation for capital elites. It's only been really in some sense since the 60s and 70s that um, really, uh, you know, maybe truly radical or progressive advocacy planners began to try to flip the script there a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's very typical that a history of urban planning is a, is a history of, of capital harnessing these very powerful rhetorical and visual arguments in order to substantiate these kinds of interventions. And why wasn't so much of Chicago's, uh, of Burnham's plan for Chicago realized? Because the small landowners and the small business people that weren't in the commercial club said, you can't build a boulevard through my property. Um, until urban redevelopment, the mechanisms of eminent mm -hmm. domain and the, the legal and administrative mechanisms are so much more effective um, that they do end up being able to acquire huge amounts of space, uh, despite sometimes the small business person saying no, like Savit Jewelers here in New Haven, saying you can't condemn my property for the Church Street redevelopment. I just built a beautiful new building here. It's certainly not, not uh, uh, blighted. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's that that the insight about uh, the links between real estate and and urban planning is sort of coming coming full circle in some some sense. Yeah. Uh, before we open it up to uh, to the audience, just given the uh, the interdisciplinary perspectives that that you all bring, uh, and with a kind of renewed interest across across fields in inequality and particularly the inequities of urbanism. Um, I just wondered if each of you could reflect on sort of anything new in the research that is uh, kind of driving new insights or understandings in the field um, that you would highlight for, uh, for our audience. Well, I, I wanted to shift the gear slightly. I think there's actually an inequity in approaches to understanding cities, too. Uh -huh. I yeah. think there's a kind of a, a visual fetish uh, when we look at cities sometimes. For example, uh, the, the word blight or slum, for example, is often, she, it's a kind of visual metaphor, like a blighted space, let's go, and we must clean it up, right? But the social experience of this place that may or may not be blighted is often very radically different by those who inhabit that space than those who look at that space from afar. Um, and so we, we're in an era of big data, right? Where data gives us the opportunity to see things in new ways, 
but it's also possible sometimes that big data can occlude our vision, right? And so I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be using data to understand cities, but I think we need a, a radically multidisciplinary agenda that says, for example, a big data person who's looking at a city should actually, if they're going to actually make a radical urban transformation, they need to live in that place for a couple months, even a year or something like that, um, before they start assuming that, for example, you know, the, these figures in the GIS map that then's been, been produced out of that can explain what it's like to live in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, I think anthropologists like myself who just go and live in areas for a while need to start learning how to use data to understand other aspects of the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, this is where I would turn the tables on you, Kate, to hear more about your work on opportunity zones and, and what are some best practices and actually um, working to, to uh, ameliorate uh, inequality at, at the urban level. I mean, I would say partly from the perspective of um, urban and architectural history or, or, or city planning uh, uh, theory, there have been huge strides forward and in rewriting a more equitable social um, history of architecture and urbanism. Uh, and there's, there's a new generation of, of so the, the work that you see in the conferences today um, are, are representing much more diversity and much more equity at the scale of the players of, of the city. There's much less, um, Despite new books about Ed Logue, for example, there's much less interest in the heroes um, and much more interest in people working from the ground up. And so one way to begin to do it is recovering a more equitable history of, of, um, of urban change and of, and of architecture and, and of urban planning. Um, but it, it would be interesting to, to get your, maybe you'll go, maybe you'll, you'll say something about this, about this as well, because um, you know, a lot of people are looking for for so solutions to this, and um, there haven't been that many good ones. Uh, it's not enough to say that we're going to encourage a certain amount of investment in gentrification in some areas to create this kind of moment of, of grace, this sort of beautiful moment of increased cosmopolitan diversity until you hit a tipping point and, and all of that kind of gets, gets lost. I would say, just to make one point, um, Many of us believe there need to be um, stronger rules and laws to do with the right to the city, to do with tenants' rights, mm. uh, to do with um, not only um, residential rent control but commercial rent control. Um, there are some controls like, like that, that that some people think are, are effective. David, you must have some thoughts well, about this. Well, I thought all that, that last bit was awful, but I'll leave it alone for right now. Um, uh, um, I, cause I, would, uh, the, the, I think the um, uh, commercial rent control, oh my goodness. Um, no? Any, oh, no, 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 no. It's a way to create huge vacancy problems because people have, because they're going to be temporary. And, uh, the I, vacancy I, problems are the ones we have right now where they, no, they no. sit on, on the buildings and they, they jack the rents up so yeah, high and they wait for the Dwayne so, Reed to so come the way, the, the way that commercial rent control generally works, it sets a rent for the length of the tenancy. So you have to wait for the high rent in order to set the rent so that it would surely have huge increases in vacancy. But I will leave it alone. You right can now. develop it better way. It's a, um, a, um, <laughs> the, the thing I want to focus on here, because I just want to, is, um, is uh, the, there has been a real increase in this kind of links to the beginning, uh, the first talk, on thinking of urban plans as platforms. And so the probably the single two most important examples of this come from early American history, the building of the New York City street grid. So when New York City street grid was built, it was, New York City had a, it was all crowded south of Houston Street. Um, uh, it was a relatively small city. It was built for a city of Manhattan, for a city of many millions. And what they did was they laid out a public realm, streets um, uh, gridded out all up, down, down, and regularized. Um, in fact, it involved uh, the, eventually the grading of uh, many hills. So Manhattan is Lenape for the island of hills. Um, and they, in fact, in order to regularize and create a market for property um, that was uh, sellable and tradable, um, uh, they uh, created regularized square rectangular property marks. And this is to, uh, to, um, uh, was one of the major sources of the fact, reason, reasons why Manhattan and, uh, develops as quickly as it does. Similarly, the Northwest Ordinances laid out the west of the United States in regularized square patterns. And there's a lot of evidence that, that the laying out of square property markets uh, property definitions, unlike we do here in New England with uh, meets and bounds where you have owned the property to the tree, to the river, et cetera, um, creates a system that uh, 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 allows for great, much greater investment. Um, 
And there's actually really neat studies that show that areas that have are mixed, so cities that are half meets and bounds, because say Virginia owned part of Ohio briefly, and they laid it out by meets and bounds, that in those cities across barriers that you can't see, the square property markers are 30% more expensive, more valuable than the, um, than the meets and bounds areas. And the idea here is that, we, that the role of law and the role of planners is to create a uh, uh, systemized market that we can then inhabit with our own investments. And this is government planning as a platform. Um, uh, and that this, uh, as we, we see vast global urbanization and the huge expansions of cities, the uh, early laying out of a public realm of street grids, and not just any street grids, but really square, rectangular street grids, of, uh, um, uh, will be extraordinarily important for uh, allowing for uh, people to develop them and doing it in advance of, um, uh, of, of, of development such that it doesn't, require, it doesn't require knocking anything down. David, can I just ask yeah. you quickly, uh, are we assuming that value uh, makes a better city? So, I mean, yeah. Cause, cause, can, yeah, I think we no, are. But I can't mean, increased values also price people out of property? So for, I mean, the, it, the, it, for the, developing. The demand for it, the value of the property is expressed in the, is a product of the fact that people want to live there. And so the, I, that and or limitations on supply, right? And so the, the idea here is that we want places that people want to live. And at, if people want to live there, the people who have resources will pay for them. And but so. But the people who have resources, that's right. Yeah. I mean, if so we're talking then, about inequities. Well, the people who have resources tend to be, a, a, yeah, and so that goes have back to Plato's city. question. We want to have vast cities such that they are, the same labor markets are accessible across a, there are a variety of types of housing in, 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 yeah, within yeah. the same metropolitan area. But yeah, I mean, I don't think that, that, that we want to, that the, the, it is a pretty natural form of that if things are nice or valuable to people, that if we ha if the people will pay for them. And so we see something called capitalization in mm. property markets, which is that if something happens in the neighborhood, so you know, someone, you know, I don't know, like uh, taxes go down or gold shoot, starts shooting from the streets or whatever, the property near there goes up in value right. because people will pay, who have money will pay for it. I think the question really is how do we build cities that are, um, accept that to the, to the number of resources are accessible to the most number of people. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Just one quick rebuttal to that, uh, you know, the, the grid of Manhattan or the Northwest Ordinance, they weren't tabula rasas. Uh, in fact, the Northwest ornament, uh, Ordinance implies an incredible displacement and land grab of people that were already there. Now, maybe, maybe, we're not ex maybe we need to accept it on its own terms, and that would be different. Same thing with Manhattan. There were settlements that were displaced to make way for, uh, for the grid. Um, the grids are not, not inevitably uh, equitable. When, when the government of New York decided to put uh, Central Park there, it immediately made those properties more, more valuable. And mm. one explanation of Central Park is another real estate value building exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty nice, though. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And, and in many ways, it's a very cosmopolitan and equitable uh, uh, park today. Um, but but the the and and there were many many uh, very forward thinking uh, aspects about it, especially with respect to mobility and the transverse roads that flow um, underneath it. But it you know people were removed to make way for Central yeah. Park um, in order to boost property values for people in the know who speculated on them in the first place. Mm -hmm. The grid of Manhattan uh, uh, drove inequality. Uh, uh, yeah. On the other hand, this is actually really interesting. So uh, <laughs> that um, the the way the grid was paid, the street paving was paid for, was with special assessments along the road. So it's actually this amazing innovation in legal technology. It's the first mass use of eminent domain in American history, really. Mm -hmm. um, and what it was, the, but the the money most property owners ended up having to pay rather than getting paid, even though their property was being taken um, because the property values that next to the roads went up by so much. This actually led to a fame. The guy who wrote was the night before Christmas actually owned a large portion of Chelsea and he was really against the street grid. Um, because, uh, and um, uh, he declared that the street commissioners were the type of people who would, uh, if they saw the seven hills of Rome, would pave them immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and he ended up being an unbelievably rich real estate developer. 
because as they drove roads through it, the, the, the value of his property went up by a huge amount. And so it was actually, in an in interesting way, it was a really interesting mechanism for what we now call value capture. That for basic, people who already had property that, oh, and yeah, who weren't displaced. The, the street grid was, <clears throat> right. I mean, but on the other hand, New York yeah. City became a place that and have it got, pe got people from all over the world to move. And so to say that the street grid was bad for equality is a very narrow I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I'm saying that there's, view, yeah. a, there's a give, give and take to this. So for, for example, in this, the place that I wrote my book about, um, they evicted 14,600 yeah. households to, yeah. to transform property boundaries. Yeah. That's 14,000, that's households. Each household in Vietnam has five to six, that's about 60,000 people. This is to deliver a kind of new property this arrangement. This is why it's really important and it's to bringing do value up. Mass of, of before there are lots of people there, right? So no. that there are people, and obviously most places have some inhabitants, but it's really important to lay out a public realm mm. well before you have mass population. Because mm. if you wait until this situation, then you, it's either impossible or unbelievably, and the human costs are way too high. So doing it well before you have mm. a real population growth, which is almost mm. uh, almost never happens. So, well, yeah. I mean, that's the well, story of our time. Just yeah. one last point. Is the yeah. story of our time is building from historic models and applying them to contemporary, where there, there's no place on the globe where you'll find no people, yeah. Uh, yeah. especially in, in a place where you want to build uh, urban developments. Yeah. And yeah. so these kinds there's of just stories many more are quite dangerous. Yeah. And, I, and I would just say, don't look to urban form to solve the equity issue. Uh, that's another form of environmental determinism here. Don't look to the grid or some other form to fix the equity issue. It's, it's, it, it, it's the other issues underneath it. That's, that would be my suggestion to, mm -hmm. to this group. So I want to invite, invite you all into the conversation. Uh, we're going to take three questions at once and then uh, turn it back over to the panel. Do you want to give us the first, the first question, sir? Is there a microphone? Sorry. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, Michael Greenway. Uh, thank you all for bringing us together. Um, Tim brought up the a graph that showed the number of people who are moving to cities. Now, I assume, or, the, or the growth in the population of cities throughout the world. Um, I'm sure this is not due to birth rate, it's due to people moving into cities. Now, people are moving into cities, I would imagine, are generally on the poorer spectrum, generally. Um, so, what does that do to cities? that must increase the inequality. Okay, let's take two more, yes. Kathleen Shoemaker, Town of Hamden. Uh, Professor Rubin, would you please unpack that last comment you made, other issues that we should be focused sure. on? Mm -hmm. Okay, and one more, yes, right here in front. Thanks, uh, Julian McCrone, first year MEM. Um, just wondering um, if we can maybe approach a question that I think um, came out really uh, interestingly in some of Eric's comments and certainly um, in, in the back and forth between um, David and Elihu, um, but just this matter of, of addressing equity and equity in cities. And um, if real estate and property is a key factor in, in increasing social mobility and in accessing just economic livelihood in a capitalist state generally, then how are we designing cities um, and looking forward to, to promoting um, greater shared ownership of cities and the, the actual private realm and um, real estate in these places? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the three questions are, uh, if we see an increase in people moving to cities, does that is it actually poor people moving to cities? And part of what you're it, it, arguing yes. is that it's, it's, it's yes, and that's good. I mean, mm -hmm. so that the uh, the uh, the that it is a good thing if people who are uh, have uh, less opportunity in farms or that farm technology has changed have are are, are able to move to places that have greater opportunity, and we should do everything in within our power to accommodate them, um, and that includes building. Uh, uh, the types of infrastructure that are necessary to integrate them. It requires b building out urban education. It will put extraordinary stress on our cities 
extraordinary stress. But the goal should be to make them accessible to uh, the vast influx. I mean, and by the way, this is much more a global story than a domestic one. That the, there's not going to be much more urbanization in the United States. Um, there'll be shifts in where urbanization takes place in the United States, but the rural population is now sufficiently small that there can't be much more. Um, it's, uh, there's just not that many more people to increase, unless we have a, I mean, a, a lot more immigration. Um, and so the, ur the, Amer the American urban population will not increase except as the national population increases too much more anymore. This is much more a story about everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so the other two questions have to do with equity and equity. And in some ways, this really does relate back to the opportunity zones point that you brought up. And, um, the way in which we have a kind of history of redlining that systematically left people of color and, and black Americans in particular out of that, that equity stake in, in mm -hmm. the housing market. Um, and now we have these opportunity zones, which many cases lay right on top of those old redlining maps, right. being an opportunity for uh, others to come in and take advantage of whatever appreciation might occur in those zones and uh, those living in those communities may or may not and people suspect likely may not be the true beneficiaries. I of think we all dislike the opportunity zone though problem for though for maybe for different reasons. So yeah. do you want to ref first? <laughs> well, I was, the opportunity um, zone program? Well, no, I, 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 well, I was going to defer to you guys on the yeah. opportunity zones yeah. actually because uh, Kate, I know you've done work about yeah. them specifically here in New Haven. Um, that'd be great to, to share with, with the group and then maybe I could try to answer some of the other questions too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what we did was we were looking nationally to see how communities were mobilizing in ahead of this program with an understanding that without getting organized at the community level, likely most of the benefits would flow uh, away from community. Um, and so we were curious to see what some of the possibilities were in um, that that could inspire uh, New Haveners um, and it's such a bonkers public policy it's one of these things it's like it's mind-blowingly bonkers to me it's a that there's these great stories that have come out about the designation of the arts district in Los Angeles and then a part of down the richest part of Detroit being designated as opportunity zones mm -hmm. and if you think about the incentives that are created by the program this is exactly what everyone expected would happen, which is that if you're going to basically create a giant tax break for people to defer their capital gains in, if they invest in areas, particularly in real estate in areas, and then you give to local politicals the capacity to designate those areas within certain categories, um, they're, because they're going to be competing for all of this investment, they're going to put it in the most attractive places possible because they want the money to go to their state rather than another state. So Long Island City in New York City is an opportunity zone designated area. Mm -hmm. um, and like, well, Long Island City is fast growing already. It was an, it, Amazon decided to locate there before it decided not even before in advance of the opportunity zone program. Mm -hmm. And it's because, well, it's right next, it's a short subway stop away from Manhattan, a few subway stops away from Manhattan. Um, the um, the the idea that this is a anti-poverty program is bonkers, mm -hmm. just bonkers. Um, uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a um, and it uh, it um, yeah. So the opportunity zone program. Oof. Um, uh, the one thing I will say though is that the um, the there is a widespread belief that the way that the problem of urban property markets is created by developers. Um, and or landlords. Um, and I think this is wrong. Um, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, um, we culturally make developers look like bad guys. Every movie has a developer is a bad guy. You see it very frequently. Um, but almost all houses that any of us live in were built by someone, um, frequently by someone who sold them for a profit. That's who builds houses, um, unless you live in public housing. Um, or other government provided housing. Um, and the same way that we don't think food, you know, and pe farmers are bad because we have to pay money for food, developers aren't bad because they, miss it, they sell houses for profit. Um, the um, question, really, I think the villains or the villains of the housing property store are the rest of us, all of us who participate in housing politics, who make it hard to live in uh, the most in demand areas. Mm -hmm. I'd push back on that a little bit. I mean, you can differentiate a farmer from 
a GMO producing Monsanto or something like that. And I think there's, that. there's categories of developers. I, and I, I would agree with you on that, on that case. Um, on this question of equity in cities and shared ownership, um, these developments are actually a, a good case in point, right? So the major development in urban Ho Chi Minh City, for example, the, the way in which the equity emerges isn't always because of a kind of nefarious intention of the developer, but there's also structural qualities of that process. Let me give you an example. You have two families living next to each other in a neighborhood who are very similar in terms of their everyday equi equitability. They live in houses that look the same. They interact with each other. They sell like noodles out in the, in the front of their house on the street. The other guy sells coffee in front of the street. One of those families happens to have a little bit of money saved aside from uh, you know, family in California who's Im migrated to the United States after the Vietnam War. One of them doesn't. The other one actually has a little bit of debt to a hot money lender or something like that. When the, when the, when the project comes to town, what happens, and it's not because the developer wanted this to happen, but th there's a structure of the economy of the project. When that fa these, those two families now are given some compensation money and then are, have to go out and find some new land um, in the areas surrounding the district. The family that had a little bit of capital beforehand, the very minute they hear that this project is coming, they go off and buy a piece of land for a, a certain amount of money per square meter. The other family can't do that. Then when the compensation comes, the land prices have gone up surrounding the property development because that's what happens when mm. major developments occur. All of the land around it goes up in price. So the first family is actually in a great situation. They have a new investment that's gone up in value and they get compensation and they're doing quite well. The second family has compensation and they can't afford to buy anything in the area. So this dramatically transforms two families that previously were very similar in social status, slightly different income and saving profiles, and then ultimately they're in a totally different situation. Now, do we blame the developer? I don't think you can blame the developer for that happening, right? But you, I, I think as a society, we have to be aware of the ways in which these kinds of developments can radically transform the profile of investment and in inequality. Now, an a migrant to the city may actually have been in one of those two structural positions that actually makes them better off than an original inhabitant of the mm -hmm. city, too. So this can lead to that other question about migration and urban inequality and those yeah. kinds of issues, too. Yeah, I wanted to come back to migration, too, but just on the issue of urban form, I think my point was that it may be more, it may be more important to look at access to capital than having the grid, for example. The, the urban form, um, in my own view, is, is, is there can be great urban form, and it can, they can be developed in very many different ways, but that wouldn't be the driving uh, factor. That, to me, falls into a trap of, of a form of environmental determinism. And it, it are, the other factors include um, access to capital, access to information, um, for, for example. Um, the issue with, with immigration is fascinating. Um, I think I, I would say that it is a dual story once again. For the most successful cities, the people coming into the cities do have a lot of money. They become very unaffordable. And that's what some people call the great inversion, that all of a sudden middle class people say, I don't want to live in the suburbs anymore. I want to live in the city. Um, and in some cases, the suburbs are becoming more and more affordable, and we have a it's not really that new anymore, but for the last couple of decades, we have what we call ethnoburbs in some places where the best um, ethnic restaurant is actually in the old strip mall that's been recovered as part of a suburbanization of Chinatown or suburbanization of, uh, of, of an ethnic uh, neighborhood that would have at one point been located in the city that's become so valuable. Uh, you know, the Lower East Side of, of New York is not really the place anymore. There are exceptions to this, I'm sure, um, where the new immigrants to the city come in. It's the place where wealthy people with mobility elect to live. Mm. But for cities that are not succeeding in that way, immigration is vitally important. It's why we have to uh, be accepting more refugees and we have to be having more immigration and not less immigration because immigrants are saving uh, struggling American cities. My friend and colleague uh, Lana Barber has written a terrific book about Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is one of these classic old New Haven textile mill towns. It's called Latino City, how um, Latinos saved uh, the Lawrence. 
And, it's, and you see that over and over and over the place. You see small towns in the middle of Kansas where, um, where Somalis are playing a huge role in reviving those, mm -hmm. those places. And those are situations where there are opportunities for poor immigrants to come and really play a role in revitalizing some, some of these cities. And we're hoping that places like uh, Lawrence will become major uh, su success stories. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not easy to, to do. It's becoming, people are writing about it more. Another colleague of mine has a book coming out in just a week, I think, called Barrio America, which is a similar theme um, in some sense that, uh, again, focusing in this case on Latino immigration, although it's not exclusive to Latino immigration, being so important in, uh, in helping to revitalize some of the struggling post-industrial cities. Yeah. Let's take another round. Over here in the back, right by the microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Miriam Dryblatt. I'm a third year in the Master of Architecture program. And I'm kind of curious because of the discussion of developers. Um, I think they were said, you know, rapacious at worst and, you know, maybe giving some community incentives at best. Um, but also, also the argument that most of the spaces that we inhabit are, are developed to some extent by a developer. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of models there are to incentivize developers um, to consider more kind of a municipal goals, objectives for creating equity, um, and also um, community benefits. Uh, if you guys can speak to that, that'd be great. Yes, in the front here. Hi, my name is Eric Bard. I um, operate an environmental nonprofit in Long Island City. Um, so I have some familiarity there, and I lived there for 21 years. Um, also, uh, just I'm not sure Clement Clark Moore is the example you want to go with because he was really ardently invested in his racism and classism. So you know, <laughs> he might have also enjoyed some of that. Um, but um, one thing I, I was wondering about is how do we factor in uh, things that have longer time scales that we know are coming? For example, in Long Island City, you have the, th uh, with the largest public housing development in North America in the Queens Bridge Houses, and um, you have the Astoria Houses and Ravenswood Houses, all part of NYCHA. And there's a great pressure now to slice off parcels for private development and things like that. Um, and uh, even may maybe even displace entirely and you know, redevelop elsewhere inland and all that. And that's largely because the waterways have cleaned up. People want to be near the water. Right. It used to be rendering facilities and things like that there in the past, uh, power plants and whatnot. So when you have long scale improvements coming down the pike, like Newtown Creek in Long Island City is now a super fun zone. It will be cleaning up. Um, we have truck uh, intensive areas like in the South Bronx that in 20 years may be electric trucks. So you won't have that diesel contamination. Hmm. We know these are coming along. So how do we then plan to make sure that you have an inclusive thing that not when like you, when you flip the switch, you, when you have reached that point where the waterways are cleaner, when you've reached that point where the trucks are no longer polluting you know, the air around the schools and all that, that we don't have that sudden rush to displace and development, uh, develop because we, we know it's coming. Mm -hmm. How do we bake that in? Mm -hmm. Let's take one more. Yes. Hi there. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Microphone. You right there? Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry, I have a microphone. Can I? Oh, uh, sorry. go ahead. I'm just a little shy. Whoever's the conch shell. Um, hi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My name is Stacy. I actually work for the New Haven City Plan Department. Um, been there for about two years. So I'm um, really curious about uh, participatory um, public engagement, um, like truly participatory. I know that we all say we really value it, but clearly I think we're reaching a point where we are beginning to. I, I think find that the models that are taught maybe in planning schools or just acknowledge across the planning profession might be outdated and aren't necessarily truly participatory. Um, and that sometimes they feel more like an item on a checklist, like public participation. Right. All right, we got that. <laughs> so now let's start writing. Um, we've had like so many meetings and this many people showed up, but we don't have um, models, I don't, or maybe we do, and that's my question to you actually, is if there is um, research taking place across the country or the world or um, models that you're familiar with that are taking a more nuanced approach at a more ground up um, part participatory process for um, public engagement and input. Okay, so our first two questions are pretty related. They have to do with incentives for developers to um, 
to essentially act toward broader equity goals, and uh, the second, thinking about inclusive planning more broadly, and the third, how does community participation fit into that? I'll, I'll start with the first one, because that's a great question. I think we put too much pressure on developers and too little pressure on the rest of us. So we, uh, when we want to fund affordable housing, we say, developer, in order to build, you need to devote a certain number of units, an inclusionary zoning, very common system. Um, that doesn't apply to all the houses that were built before. And uh, we don't ask, we, everyone pays property taxes, we don't ask for special funds from everyone else to pay for these collective goods of, of affordable housing, which is a, a social need. Um, and so the effect of that is that it's a tax on development, which means that we have less of it. Um, the, uh, I, the, uh, I think that a, a healthy funding system for affordable housing or for other community needs is, uh, is a relatively collective one, one that focuses on our shared system of taxes, whether it's property income or sales, um, as opposed to things that are, are aimed exclusively at development. Because it's, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, this is the thing, in general, you should tax the things you don't want, not the things you do. Um, and if we want housing, we should uh, not subject it to extra large taxes vis-a-vis than we do other things. And so I think in general, we should set out standards um, in the sense of we should either plot land, we should have basic height limits um, or density limits if we so desire uh, within uh, that are flexible enough to accommodate demand. And then we should tax everyone, uh, including the incumbents who are voting for taxes. So that's one of the reasons it doesn't happen. Um, uh, but um, it is a, uh, the, the pressure to put all of our need for new things on, the, uh, on, on new developers and then for on new tenants um, is, a, uh, uh, is a, it's a mechanism for exclusion rather than inclusion. Mm -hmm. And this is another case where the regional, the lack of regional governance becomes yeah. an issue because the city can only control what happens within the city yeah. boundaries. And in, in the New Haven area, you have something like 33% of affordable units in, in the city, whereas in the surrounding towns, Guilford, uh, Madison, it's 1 or 2% mm. of the housing stock that's, yeah. that's affordable. So if you're only focusing, because that's where you're, you're regulatory power is on those city developers, you're letting all of that kind of those regional other spaces, yeah. you're leaving them out of the conversation. Right. You know, I would say in my observations, the trend is not towards high taxation for developers, it's to tax abatements um, without sufficiently extracting enough community benefits uh, from those tax abatements. And what I would say is that many cities New Haven is not the worst in this uh, at all, but for many cities, you need to get out of the austerity mindset. We're willing to do anything to cultivate this investment. Um, and we should be taxing them um, as much as we possibly can. And uh, that, that's, that's what I would say. Um, and that would be one way to extract commun community benefits from them. What we end up happening, unfortunately, are these sort of one-off ad hoc CBAs that are negotiated by whatever um, nonprofit or community organization happens to have their foot in the door at that, at that moment. Um, and it's not necessarily the best way to do it. And then meanwhile, we have this trend towards developers providing the most exciting new public spaces. So coming back to the New York waterfront kind of issue, take a place like Domino Park in Brooklyn. They create this incredible new park um, that is meant to be a huge community benefit. Now, I don't want to malign it um, on the face of it. It's a very interesting park, and it may end up being a very useful public space for many, many different people. But we end up entering this new what we now call neoliberal engagement in which we expect the private sphere to build all of the public realm stuff. And not everyone agrees that that's the best way uh, to do it um, and that we should be m more demanding of, of these developers. We should be giving fewer tax abatements, especially when developers take advantage of, I'm not very invested in rescuing the reputation of developers. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the developers take advantage of these tax abatements until they write off the project, then they flip it. What they're building often only has a 10 to 15 year life cycle anyway, especially when you look at the new four over ones or four over twos with the concrete base and the stick frame above. I mean, mm. some of this stuff, uh, 
you know, th this is going to be a major problem in 25 years in, in, in many cases, unless we intend to clear it and build again. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that the incentive structure for developers really could be, uh, could be shifted in, in a different way. And yeah, in some cases, maybe less development is, is just as well. We could be d doing more to be cultivating grassroots development of putting capital in the hands of local people, uh, letting them build accessory dwelling units, for example, as a student of mine was recently researching, um, and, to, and to do it that way. And then just very quickly on the par participation mm -hmm. method, this is such an important question. Uh, you know, one, it's hard to get out of the bind. I mean, and David, you referred to this as well. One of them is not just to put the open call for the meeting, but be doing active outreach. Of course, mm -hmm. it's expensive to do that, and who has the time? It's very difficult with our overworked uh, municipal planners. But to actually go out there and really, really get out there, survey them and go door to door, the other the mm. other antidote is more community-based planning, which means taking yeah. things out of the hands of City Hall sometimes, but allowing people to articulate their own community-based visions. This is where we at Yale can be doing more by offering our time and services to work with community groups to articulate plans that, that end up having more, um, more, more meaning. Mm. You know, it, sorry, just on this last point about the issue of the improvements creating displacement. This is another huge bind. You have some neighborhoods that don't want improvements because they're worried that it will hasten gentrification and displacement. Mm -hmm. This is another really confounding uh, issue. Of course we want to clean up Newtown Creek, um, but we don't want it to lead to the displacement of the existing neighborhood. This is why I would like someone to come up with a better solution mm -hmm. than, than stronger regulations on what property owners can do with respect to rents. That there is such a thing as a right to the city. A right to the city that is built based on your body being in that space for a long period of time. And we can't just let the market at their whim decide to do what they want to do. There has to be some way to protect but them. The right to the city has to require some ability to actually live there. And so this ne necessitates in high demand areas lots and lots of houses. And the, unless you have some mechanism for producing lots and lots and lots of houses, as nature was, um, uh, there's no, if it's a high demand area, you can't have a right to something unless it actually you can provide for it. And so the, um, the um, and of course, this is one of the classic rent control arguments is that it inhibits development. And so this is a, uh, the, 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 if you declare that someone has a right to the city, you have to provide some mechanism for it. And so this is a, uh, this requires building. And so whether it's done through, very laudable things like liberalization of ADUs, which is a wonderful thing, um, or whether it's done through rapacious evil developers, there has to be houses. There, I mean, there's no there's no other mechanism for getting people into the city. Um, and so the um, the the um, if there's a high demand to live there, and so take nature. So I think nature is a wonderful thing. It's a, it's um, uh, um, on the other hand, it's got this extraordinary funding problem that has led to an extraordinary lead paint problem. The, I think the city is done, doing exactly the right thing in allowing some, some, some corner units in these Le Courbusier style tower in the park buildings to be uh, bid out for private development. Um, it will provide a huge amount of revenue to actually make nature livable, um, which it currently is not. Um, uh, and uh, further, it will increase access to these areas that have uh, increasingly high quality amenities. And so I don't think there's, the, the answer to gentrification such as it is, is building housing where people want to be. And very frequently, that's not in gentrifying areas, but it's in rich areas that aren't allowing housing at all. You want to avoid <laughs> gentrification in Long Island City, build housing in Greenwich Village. I, I just want to interject on this last point about participatory engagement. Um, in connection to this a little bit, uh, what you're saying here, David, I think that uh, for true participation, participation, you have to come into any setting willing to not do the thing that you think you want to do. Um, and I don't think that's driving a lot of development. And so despite what, the logic of what you're saying, David, in many ways I actually agree. You need houses, right? But if the people in the area you think need houses don't want the houses, too bad. Um, you know, in, in, some, in some regards, you have to be mindful of that real participation, in a sense. Whether you think it's the right thing or because of the, the policy projections that you've developed, they're not always going to engage in ways that are, are uh, amenable to the people who are living in that particular area, right? Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to the hubris point that I have. I think a lot of times people 
they consider participation to be an opportunity to convince people in an area that they should agree with this project that these experts have come up with. I think what really needs to be happening is experts need to be to, to do what experts do is learn from the cities themselves and then work in a kind of dialogic fashion with people who live in these cities and actually find un, un, unexpected surprises for new ways of imagining these particular places. Well, we have come to the end of our time together and so can you join me in thanking our panelists for a very vigorous discussion.